Um, this is um, some material that is partly quite new to me, and partly uh, some themes I've been working on for a long time. I've been interested in visualization, not resulting from computation, but just straight visualization in physics, in mathematics, in, in a number of areas, and uh, what's, you know, how visual reasoning works and so on. Um, but I'm generally interested in mathematics, and so putting the two together was uh, a kind of a natural thing to do. I have um, uh, I've, I've introduced something new rather recently, and that's uh, taken an interest in ethical reasoning and the similarities there are between some parts of ethical reasoning and mathematical reasoning. It's surprising. And uh, Nick has seen little bits of this before. Uh, I have tried it out on philosophy audiences once or twice. It is generally received with some skepticism, as any, <laughs> as any philosophy talk is. Uh, I've never tried it out on mathematicians before. Normally, I do give talks with you know, uh, uh, transparencies or, or, or with a projector, but I thought I'd do old-fashioned chalk and talk this time so I can watch faces <laughs> and see extreme skepticism <laughs> and anger and agitation boiling up and I'll, uh, you, I can you quickly can update the term because it's pen and not chalk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, let me begin with um, uh, a stunning result. Uh, I'm going to refute the continuum hypothesis, <laughs> but, but not in the normal way. Okay? So you all know the continuum hypothesis, Hilbert's first problem. It's simply the claim that the cardinality of the real numbers is the first uncountable infinite set. Uh, you also know, I hope, that uh, it is independent of the rest of mathematics. You can't prove it. You can't refute it. But you can still ask, is it true or is it false? The answer is, it's false. And I'll show you why. <laughs> um, let's, let's take just the real numbers between 0 and 1, and we'll throw a couple of darts at them. So I'll get um, uh, uh, Jonathan Raw to throw darts at the real line. And then they're going to bet against one another. And let's suppose Raw hits P. And he's going to say, no chance you get an O. Oh, I miss one crucial step. <laughs> the background to all of this is zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice. Uh, and we're going to assume the continuum hypothesis is true. We're going for a reductio ad absurdum here. Okay? Now, the real numbers can be well-ordered. Imagine they're well-ordered. They're lined up with the ordinals. Now we'll throw our darts. There goes one dart. <laughs> And Jonathan says, no chance you're earlier than me in the well-ordering. Why? Because the well-ordered reals between 0 and 1 are of length aleph 1. Any initial segment lined up with any ordinal along there must be a countable set. It's bumped down a cardinality. <laughs> Therefore, the probability that, that, um, that Rob's going to land in a set defined by uh, Jonathan's uh, point is zero, probability zero. It's measure zero, hence probability zero, okay? But the throws are perfectly symmetrical. And so, and so Rob is going to make exactly the same bet that there's no chance um, Jonathan is going to land in his. Now in any pair of throws, one of them's got to be earlier than the other, right? Probably. <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> and what it means is that uh, one of them is going to pull off a miracle. Yeah. Okay? okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. That is absurd. <laughs> Who do we blame? Probability. <laughs> Either that, or God, or the continuum hypothesis. And that's it. That's the proof. Okay? It's a wonderful little argument, and two questions arise. Does it work? <laughs> I don't know. I'm slightly inclined to think it does. But I don't want to fight about that. What I want to ask is, is it a legitimate argument, legitimate in principle? Do you think the kind of techniques used to just refute the continuum hypothesis are legitimate? 
I All right. I, I, no, I think that is not legitimate. You think, it's, you think it's illegitimate in principle? Okay. Anyway, that's what's at issue now. And I'm going to talk about a whole lot of other stuff and then come back to this at the end. Okay. All right? Because the only thing I'm interested in is its legitimacy. Then we can fight over whether the actual proof works. It's like arguing with someone over reductio ad absurdum. You might give a particular instance of it and somebody say, oh no, you divided by zero in line 27. Yeah, yeah, but is the technique in general legit? Okay? All right, um, for most of us, we're empiricists, which means that all of your knowledge comes through the senses somehow or other. All of your beliefs have to be justified by sensory experience one way or the other. This is um, common sense, almost every philosopher believes it, but there's two huge, huge problems. One of them is mathematics, and the other one is ethics. You can see A kill B, but it is not part of your empirical experience that this is murder, that this is wrong, or anything like that. This is an extra empirical judgment that you add on. And the same with mathematics. You don't, none of you justify your mathematical beliefs by actually going out into the empirical world. These have always been problems for empiricism. And there's one way to just overcome it, and that's to give up empiricism, which I think any sensible person does. But you can <laughs> <laughs> it is, but a special kind. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the mathematicians have given it up. I mean, implicitly they've given it up. Uh, and, pe and most people in ethics have given it up too. There's a small number who want to try and deal, uh, try and save their empiricism and have ethics. But it, it's almost impossible. So the thing to do is to simply bite the bullet, become mathematical realists, Platonists, <laughs> or ethical realists, sometimes called Platonists, but they usually just stick to ethical realists. Now there's two ingredients in, in this. One is the claim that uh, there are facts there, objective facts that are out there independent from us, and uh, we try to find them out. And the second ingredient is the epistemology. That is, we do have a way of learning. It's not just stuff out there that happens to be true or false, but we have no access. We actually believe we have access of some sort or other. These are really hard problems inside philosophy. Okay? They're, they're problems that philosophers worry a very great deal about, um, in ethics or in mathematics or in a lot of places, actually. Okay. Now, um, if you ask an ordinary mathematician where does knowledge come from, a lot of them will say, well, proofs, of course. But that's never been a sufficient answer. I know I'm preaching to the converted here because all of you are fighting with regular mathematicians most of the time, I suspect, anyway. But it's always been a lousy answer to say proof because proofs require first principles to start from. And somewhere you have to just have a starting point and some reason for believing that starting point. Unless you think it's all just a game, an arbitrary game. But that's a pretty poor account of mathematics. Um, you have similar problems in ethics. Um, also, uh, mathematics is clearly fallible, not because people make mistakes in proofs, but the, the most, those are actually boring, uninteresting uh, kinds of mistakes in mathematics. The really interesting ones are when you have some sort of conceptual change. And uh, there are lots of nice examples. My favorite is just the history of the concept of function. In the 18th century, it was probably a perfectly respectable theorem that all functions are continuous. Nobody believes that now. And it's not because there was a flaw in the proof in the 18th century, it's because the concept of function has changed radically. Now it's an arbitrary um, association between uh, two sets, and so you can have the Dirichlet function, for instance. In fact, that was a big battle. Okay. Um, in, for philosophers, they uh, often want some kind of empirical evidence, even for even some philosophers of mathematics are willing to go along with mathematics being a body of objective truths existing independently from ourselves. We don't make it up. But they need some way of access to it that isn't a mystery. So they tie it to physics. This is a popular move. And they'll look for mathematical explanations of events in the physical world or phenomena in the physical world. Um, a very impressive example that's quite popular now 
is known as the cicada example, which uh, uh, philosophers would know well. So the, here's a phenomenon, an interesting phenomenon. Cicadas come out of the ground every 17 years, and uh, there's tons of them. They live for only a short time, just a few days. They mate, they lay eggs, they die, the eggs turn into larva and remain underground for 17 years, and then the cycle comes again. How the hell do you explain this? It's a very curious biological phenomenon. And the explanation that has been offered and widely accepted is that 17 is a prime number. It's unusual to explain biological phenomena mathematically, but it's a prime number. So how, how does this work? Well, the strategy, the biological strategy, is called um, predator satiation. So the cicadas come out, they completely overwhelm anything that's going to eat it. Most of them will be able to reproduce, and that's it. How could, this, how could they be undermined in this strategy? Answer, a predator tracks them. Okay? But the thing is, this is a rather longish number, and it's prime. So most predators will have like a two year, a one year cycle, a two, three, maybe a five year cycle. But imagine the predators with, a, with a, like say a five year cycle. They would only coincide with the cicadas every, what, 85 years or something like that. Okay, so it becomes impossible for them in the Darwinian sense to track the cicadas and this is the way uh, cicadas you know, do their Darwinian thing. But you see how crucial the notion of a prime number is here. Okay? So, so what is this, what, why, why do you think going to argue like this? The answer is we have no access to Plato's heaven. But if those are the facts there, they would explain phenomena here that we can observe empirically, right? And credit for this correct explanation, some of the credit must go there, and that's a reason for believing that's true. Okay, see the argument? Okay. Now, if you're a serious Platonist, of course, you just embrace intuitions, and that is you have direct access to Plato's heaven. All right? But it remains a mystery, and it's a fight inside philosophical circles, because all the empiricists want something like the cicada example to carry the weight, and the, and the Platonists say, no, no, I actually have this extra cognitive capacity you guys don't appear to have. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, let me talk about, because the cicada example is an example of, of the application of mathematics into the sciences. Um, so so it's, it's, it's an interesting philosophical question. What is the nature of applied mathematics? We seem to know lots and lots of examples of it, but it's hard to characterize. And uh, if, you, if you ask philosophers what is, what is applied mathematics or what's the difference between pure and applied, you'll get an almost uniform answer. And they'll say, look, if it's, um, um, if it's uh, completely, if what you're talking about is completely internal to mathematics, it's pure. But if you're talking about something outside of mathematics, like cicadas or apples or, or gravitational fields or something like that, then it's applied. And they'll give you an absolutely trivial example. Two apple, sorry, two plus two equals four, that's pure. <laughs> two apples plus two apples equals four apples, that's applied. <laughs> now, you can see it's a perfectly straightforward um, uh, distinction. It's perfectly objective. Uh, you can apply it in all kinds of uh, complicated cases. It doesn't have to be all trivial about baskets of apples. But it's, um, but it's completely different than I think most mathematicians would give. The reason philosophers give this kind of example, I suspect, is because they want the, the, the mathematical realm to be distinct from the physical realm, and they want to ha have, have very specific questions about how we know about that, and not mess it up with the physical stuff. Okay? Most ma working mathematicians, I suspect, wouldn't give that kind of distinction. And, uh, and I'm thinking of people Maybe they're bad examples, but I mean, when I read people like Hardy or Halmos, who talked a lot about the nature of pure and applied mathematics, maybe you get a rather biased and prejudicial view. They're certainly snobs about, about pure mathematics, even obnoxiously so. But you can see what they're getting at, and I suspect a lot of people might still agree with them. And the thing is, a, a thing that makes like, it could be a piece of physics, 
But the thing that makes it um, uh, pure mathematics is that your interest in the problem is a mathematical interest in the problem. And if your interest in the problem is to solve the physics of the situation, then it's applied. And that's the real difference. It's not the philosopher's distinction, it's, it's a different one. This is a much more subjective um, distinction. Um, it makes uh, pure mathematics a kind of, you know, what you're interested in or not interested in and so on. But you can sort of see how it goes. There's even a nice example of this by Paul Halmos that some of you may know already. Um, and he says, uh, not only is the problem that you're dealing with, does it depend on, on uh, whether it's pure or not, but the solution to the problem may in fact put it into the pure versus the applied camp. So he had an example, I'll change it slightly. So suppose you're, you have to run a hockey tournament here in London and something like uh, 583 hockey teams show up and you have to figure out how many hockey games there are going to be. Perhaps you're in charge of booking all the local arenas for, for all these various matches. And the way the competition goes is, you know, team A plays team B and then the winner goes on to the next round and so on until you've got a final winner at the end. Okay, suppose you've got that many teams, how many matches? How many know an answer? Don't tell, just let me know if you know the answer. Have you got a wonderful solution to it, or you just calculated very quickly? I knew. Oh, you knew already. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's all kinds of, there's really stupid ways to tackle it. Probably a relatively smart way is to just keep dividing by two, uh, taking care of odd numbers as you go along until you, 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 you get to a final answer. But there's a much better answer. Everybody focuses on the winners going ahead. Focus on the losers. Notice how the tournament is set up. Every team loses exactly once, except the final winner. And every game has exactly one loser. So <laughs> it means that, <laughs> you see, this, if you've got n teams, you've got n minus one matches. It's as simple as that. Notice that Donald Trump could not solve this problem that way. That way. You have, to, you have to be a bleeding heart liberal who cares about losers. Proof <laughs> <laughs> yet again. The socialists are smarter than anybody else. Equal bias. Okay. Yeah, bye. All right. Uh, you know, you, I probably don't have to tell you, you know the examples from. Uh, Hardy, applied math is repulsive, ugly, interminably dull. You probably all heard that. <laughs> yeah. Helmholtz applied math is bad math. Yeah, Helmholtz says it's all bad. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really interesting, though, because as soon as Hardy starts talking about examples, he stops talking about the pure and applied, and he uses the term real. He starts talking about real mathematics. And it's number theory, but it's also general relativity, it's quantum mechanics, it's. Yeah. It's just a silly. Uh, as an example of how it's changed, yeah. I chaired the mathematics committee yeah. when, and served in the early 90s. Yeah. Members of the committee said, why are we funding general relativity? What possible applications does it have? All right. Now, let me uh, uh, switch gears and uh, start talking about ethics. Okay, so this is where it's going to sound a little weird to many of you. Um, it, you can, it, my ethics colleagues don't use the term pure and applied ethics. They use the term applied ethics. But they've got a whole lot of terms that I can mush together and just call it pure ethics. There's normative ethics, there's um, meta-ethics, there's, what else? I don't know, there's a half dozen <laughs> other, other terms that they use, but it's, you could just sort of put it all together and call it um, pure ethics. Now, let me, I'm going to give you two examples of typical ethical reasoning, and one of them will be pure and one apply, and the moral of the story will be you're not going to see a difference, okay? So the first one will be um, a very famous article 
um, in favor of allowing of the permiss moral permissibility of abortion. So here's a very traditional argument endorsed by the Catholic Church, but it's not a religious argument. It goes like this. The fetus is an innocent person. Innocent persons have a right to life. Abortion would deprive the fetus of its life. Therefore, abortion is morally wrong. Okay? Everybody see the argument? Catholic Church endorses it, even though it's not a religious argument. It's meant to appeal or persuade everybody. All right? So, if you're going to meet this argument, as Judith Thompson did, head on, you need to show that it's a bad argument. Okay? And the typical way is to find a counterexample, an, an example which has the same structure, but is obviously wrong. Okay? So here comes the famous violinist thought experiment from Judith Thompson. It goes like this. Jonathan is a famous violinist, but he's deathly ill. We all enjoy his music, but he's going to die in a few days. The music-loving society, right here, have decided that they're going to save his life, even though he said, let me die in peace. <laughs> And they found a victim, Nick. <laughs> they scoured the medical records of the world, and he is the one and only blood type or whatever that can, in fact, work. In the middle of the night, they break into his apartment, dragging poor John, who's comatose, <laughs> and is utterly innocent. With his violin. With his violin. <laughs> poor Nick's sound asleep. They hook him up. And Nick wakes up in the morning, and he says, well, what the hell is this? I don't want this. And he's about to unhook Jonathan when the Music Lovers Society point out. Violinists are innocent persons. All innocent persons have a right to life. To unhook this violinist would kill him. Therefore, it is immoral to unhook him. You're going to have to stay in bed with this guy <laughs> for nine months. <laughs> All right? And then you'll get better. Now, at this point, here's where, here's where moral intuitions. I hope he, you play well. No. <laughs> no, he's comatose. I probably did before I spied to you. <laughs> so anyway, the upshot is uh, you're, you're, this, this is supposed to elicit your intuitions. And you're supposed to think, regardless of what you thought of the initial argument for abortion, you're supposed to think, oh, no, he doesn't have to do that. If he will do it, and we could even offer him a lot of money, that would be terrific. <clears throat> Excuse me, that would be terrific. But he's not morally obliged to go through with that. And if you agree there, and then you look back at the abortion argument I gave you, you see, look, it's got exactly the same structure. If it's a bad argument in the violinist case, it's a bad argument in the ordinary case. And if the mother wishes an abortion, she's perfectly entitled to it. Okay? That's how it goes. Now, let me give you a second argument. Sorry? What does it have to do with the axiom of choice? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was one of uh, Sokol's jokes. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, now a second uh, argument. This is called the trolley argument. So the trolley argument is just this. You, you, you've got a trolley, that's, it's, the brakes are broken, it's run away, it's running down the tracks, and there's five tourists gawking it you know, up in the air. They don't see it, and it's, and it's just going to go ahead and it's going to wipe them out. It's going to kill all five of them. You are at a place where you can just pull a lever like this and send the trolley off into a siding, and it'll save those five people. But there's one person standing on the track down the siding, gawking in the air, and you're going to kill him. Almost everybody says, what should you do? Answers the question, what should you do with pull the lever? Save five, kill one. Right? Is that everybody's intuition? Almost everybody's intuition? intuition. No, there's the occasional bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> but overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, that's what people do. So, so this is a really interesting case, and it becomes interesting because you complicate it. So you say, okay, you can't just pull the lever and send it off here, which is going to kill someone. Instead, what you do is you say, you see Nick, 
<laughs> who's actually standing there. <laughs> uh, and so there's no siding here. Here comes, here comes the trolley. He's going to wipe out five. I just tripped Nick onto the track. And he'll block the trolley. And the arithmetic is exactly the same. I kill one, save five. And people's moral intuitions flip in that case. They don't mind pulling the lever and, oh, too bad, one got killed. But they can't stomach the idea of actually pushing somebody onto the track, even though the numbers are exactly the same. So it's a really interesting moral case. <laughs> now, I'm not going to try to solve the problem. But you see, those are radically different cases from the point of view of applied ethics and pure ethics. The first one about abortion is a case of applied ethics. The one about trolley is, is considered pure theoretical ethics. And yet the way of reasoning, you know, using a visual thought experiment that elicits you know, uh, strong intuitions about what to do, is exactly the same in the two cases. So how do you know, why do I call one pure and the other applied? It's very simple. What's the violinist um, uh, thought experiment about? It's about abortion, right? It's perfectly clear. What's the trolley thought experiment about? Driverless it's cars. not about trolleys. <laughs> <laughs> driverless cars. It's about driverless cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's all alive. Okay. It's actually about utilitarianism. Yeah, okay. it, it, it's simply an example to illustrate a, 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 a general thesis about about, uh, about right, your actions. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now. This, it seems to me, is, is in fact exactly the same as the mathematician's distinction between pure and applied. What's the focus of the problem? If the focus of the problem is abortion, or you're trying to solve a physics problem, then it's applied mathematics. It might be spectacularly elegant and clever, okay? But that's applied. And it's pure because you don't care about the physics of the situation, you care about the mathematics involved in the physics of the situation. Or you don't care about the trolley, you care about trying to solve problems involving utilitarianism and ethics. Okay? That's that seems to me the, the pure applied math on the one hand and ethics on the other. And they seem to me to be exactly the same. Okay? So the standard philosopher's distinction that you get from almost every philosopher of mathematics seems to me to be it's a good distinction. I mean it's a perfectly objective and correct distinction. And for certain purposes, it's right. But for a whole lot of purposes, it's wrong. And a much more fruitful way of thinking about these things is like the ethics example, or like what mathematicians call um, uh, uh, pure mathematics, but you're involving a physics example. OK. We started five minutes late. And what are we we're going to? So you have 15 well, I've got half an hour, right? Yeah. The speaker after you is going to be mad if you want to. Who's that, you? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage me. <laughs> Never met a professor who wanted these, yeah. Okay. Now, the, um, the most important thing about these sorts of examples are the moral that you might want to draw, and that is that intuitions work. Okay? They, um, they will give you. Uh, rich examples, uh, they, sorry, they will give you uh, uh, wonderful answers to uh, rich examples, and you can actually make intellectual headway. They are fallible, incredibly fallible. Okay? I don't want to, for a minute, suggest that uh, intu intuitions and this kind of a priori reasoning is without, uh, you know, without mistakes. No, it's all over the bloody place. But you're already on side on that issue. I mean, I'm right? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So examples of visual reasoning. First, let me just give you a straight physics example, which many of you will know, but it's a reminder of how incredibly powerful this can sometimes be. This is my favorite thought experiment. It's Galileo's, uh, Galileo on free fall. Okay? So the background to this, this is Galileo dropping cannonballs and musket balls from the leaning tower of Pisa. The background to this is uh, Aristotle's view that the heavier an object is, the faster it falls. By the way, that is common sense. If you ask ordinary people, even today, 
unless they've had a good physics course rather recently, they will tell you the same. Okay? So Arist uh, Galileo's fighting Aristotle. And he drops a light musket ball and a heavy cannonball. Aristotle says the heavy cannonball falls faster than the light musket ball. What follows from that? Well, if I make an even heavier object, this composite object, it's got to fall faster than the heavy object alone. So H plus L is faster than H. But look, this thing has two parts. The heavy part is going to fall at its rate, and the light part is going to want to fall at its rate. In other words, it's going to be like a little drag. It's going to slow down. So the composite object will, in fact, be slower than a heavy object. <laughs> That's absurd. How do you resolve this problem? You just make everything fall at the same rate. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. It's a wonderful uh, little thought experiment. Um, if you actually go to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, well, I believe you can get back up on the yeah. tower, right? So smuggle up. <laughs> <laughs> and get somebody below to clear. <laughs> uh, it actually, this doesn't work. Uh, heavy objects do hit the ground faster than uh, light objects. So you do not, you can get up, you cannot get to the edge. Oh, is that right? And the stairway is so narrow, I don't have to go under Yeah. Of course, these things never end. The repeat never ends. I mean, um, for, the, for Galileo, he said, that, see, see? And then the Aristotelian would reply, don't be ridiculous. Uh, I've measured it, blah, blah, blah. And Galileo retorts, yeah, yeah, OK, you've got to get rid of the air. And the Aristotelian says, what? Get rid of the air? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you seen my proof that, that uh, the vacuum is impossible? Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so, so you see, <laughs> These, these things never end. They, they are, like any rich uh, experiment, they're endlessly interpretable, reinterpretable, debatable, and Canon so on. goals and reputations. <laughs> okay. But anyway, it's a gem, and it's, uh, it's the kind of thing I really love about uh, uh, visual, uh, visual reasoning. And I think it is safe to say that the history of physics is just loaded with wonderful thought experiments. And they play a hugely important role in the history of physics. They play a huge role in philosophy, but in philosophy they're always contentious, because you, you, you never get even close to a consensus on any of these things. And uh, while most physicists are actually quite happy with thought experiments, at least in principle, there at least, I'd say, half, the, half of our philosophical colleagues think that thought experiments inside philosophy are just verboten. They should not be there. They're, we should do something else. Okay. Now, uh, here's a math example. Many of you will know this example, but for those of you who maybe don't know it, it's a, it's a real gem. So here's the sum of the first n numbers uh, expressed as n squared divided by 2 plus n divided by 2. I've expressed it this way to go with the picture. And here's, this is a picture proof. And uh, if you haven't seen the proof, I'll give you 30 seconds. You got it. Did you see it before? I just looked right away. And you got it right away. No, yeah, sure. Good. So proofs of the words are. Yeah, yeah, I think it's in that book. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, anyway, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 4 squared, 4 squared cut in half, plus the bits that you just cut off, the 4 bits, the 4 half bits. Okay? Now, there's something truly spectacular about that example. Because, I mean, if Jonathan said, yeah, yeah, I see it works for four. <laughs> but what about a really big number, like 17? 17. 17. <laughs> okay. Does it work for all the primes? Or something like that? <laughs> Does it work for cicadas? <laughs> OK. Um, but you can see that if he even asked the question, he didn't get it, right? There's, you, there's all generality is in the proof, even though it's a special case. It's just n equals 4 for this case. And yet when you get it, you see it works for all infinitely many numbers. So I mean, that's a, it's a really important example, as simple as the example is. Uh, often you hear arguments against pictures, that they're just special cases. And you're trying to, you know, you want a result about, you know, a, a much greater generality. Well. Somehow or other, we manage to 
to get all generality out of that special case. It's almost like a miracle. You know? I don't actually know what's going on cognitively, but it's, 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 there's something about human cognitive capacity that allows us to make those kinds of generalizations. Not about probability. <laughs> <laughs> no, it works the opposite way there, I suppose. What if you erase the middle part of your diagram and put a few dots in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's uh, actually good, yeah. Yeah, so uh, in fact, let me, let me, this helps a lot. I think it makes it richer, but I don't think you need it. Okay, so let me go there, dot, 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 and there, okay? And also, dot, 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 here. Okay. And maybe diagonally as well. We want the yeah. diagonal too. Yeah. You put it in the diagonal box. Oh, oh, you mean you want here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. But, but you didn't need it, did you? No. 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 We like it. Except. <laughs> that will lead you to a formalism with an induction. That actually, that, uh, this is a little digression, but it's a really interesting digression. Whenever I show that example, the audience, and it doesn't matter if it's philosophers or mathematicians, splits almost 50 50. So here's a question. How many of you see math induction encoded in the diagram? No. How many of you see the, the proof and induction's got nothing to do with it? Same. <laughs> well, that's it. it was roughly, the, the, the poll was roughly half and half. And how many people want a formal definition of encoding? <laughs> <laughs> Are you offering one? Um, for, those of you, for, some, for those of you who think that uh, what's really going on in the proof is you do see induction, and it's induction that's, that's the proof, um, you, you haven't got it. Because remember what induction is, for the inductive line, you need to know for all n, you know, from n to n plus 1 holds. And you've only got it here from, from 2 to or something like that. I guess I you haven't got all generality. I guess I feel like you've been suffocated to induction. Yeah, yeah. So something like that. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, it's a really interesting example. Okay. Um, there are lots more examples like that. There are some results from the intermediate value theorem where you can actually have physical uh, physical examples. Um, like, uh, you know, the riddle of the uh, person who climbs a mountain one day and back down the next day. And the question is, is there any point on the side of the mountain, on the path, that the climber is at that point, same time, going up and going down? Your first intuition is, oh, it can't be, because it was really slow going up, and you went really fast going down. Uh, there couldn't be one time where you're at the same point. But all you have to do is just, just change the example very slightly and imagine two climbers, one starting at the top, one starting at the bottom, on the same day, and they meet. That's it. Okay? And you can actually, there are, you know, the cluster of theorems called the intermediate value theorem, you know, the variations of it. You can just use the mountain climbing example to see the, the correctness of it. <laughs> That's called a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the upshot, I think, of, of, uh, of, of these sorts of things is, is simply this. We have some sort of, human beings have some sort of non-empirical cognitive capacity to grasp mathematical facts. Not all of them, for sure, but a few. And they can work uh, in important ways. Perhaps, if you think of math as a bit like physics, the, the intuitions work like uh, empirical observations. There's a hell of a lot of stuff you still need to theorize about, and, uh, uh, and so on. But there can be special cases where you just see it. And if you, if you had a proof that it was wrong, you, you'd worry about the formal system that gave, gave you that. So I mean, simple examples are like, commutative law for arithmetic. You can't possibly doubt that, right? Can you? <laughs> I mean, for ordinary arithmetic. I, I, I don't give me something fancy. We have empirical evidence that at least there are some people who have. Who have actually some, doubted some, some no, students, no, some of our students. Oh, students doubt it. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. That is not a student, is it? 
All right. <laughs> and there's this famous quote from Gödel, which is of a piece with all this. Despite their remoteness from sense experience, we do have something like a perception also of the object of set theory, as is seen from the fact that the axioms force themselves upon us as being true. I don't see any reason why this should have any less, why we should have any less confidence in this kind of perception, i.e., in mathematical intuition, than in sense perception. Okay. Now, putting these things together, it's a bit of a jump, I know. But putting these things together, it suggests, even strongly suggests, that the argument I gave you for the continuum hypothesis is at least legitimate in principle. Don't worry about the details, but legitimate in principle. You know, you throw, throw a dart. You know, all right, I'm picking out a, a real number. I'm picking it out at random. Everybody agree that there's a randomness there? I disagree there. That's you exactly disagree? Where I disagree. Okay, the assumption is that, but anyway, that I could hit with, with, uh, with equal probability, I could hit any, any number. It's, it, it's deeper than that. It's the question of whether the real numbers actually measure, uh, whether that's the right model for randomness in the real world. And anyway, or, on the, line. Line, or on the real line. And it's just, so I think there's something deeply problematic about, yeah. The whole I guess what I feel is it's almost violating an uh, implicit stereotypes. You argue one thing by going up to a more complicated thing. Yeah. Yeah, you might be right. It's but it's, uh, it's necessary for the thought experiment, I think. Yes. Okay, these are criticisms of the details of the argument. Okay. Um, anyway, one assumption is the randomness. Yeah. Another assumption is the symmetry of the two throws. Wouldn't matter who threw first. Right. Uh, uh, and you're independent of one another. Your outcome is, doesn't affect his and vice versa. There's another assumption which is which you all make, and that is that the real numbers correspond to the points on the line. Yeah. I mean, everybody just believes that, since Descartes. Okay. <coughs> Medievals wouldn't have believed that. Okay. Um, now, back to ethics. Okay. Now, this is something else in ethics, uh, which is uh, I'm trying out absolutely for the first time, not just on the mathematical audience, but also on a philosophy audience. There are a few. <laughs> in, inside ethics, there's a distinction between what are called thick and thin concepts. So most concepts are thin. And it arises in the fact value distinction. So if I say he's wearing a beige shirt, beige is a thin concept. Okay? If I says if I say his shirt is magnificent. Magnificent is a thin concept. The beige color is from the physics side. It's a, a fact, if you, if you like. But it's a thin concept. And the magnificence of your shirt is, is on the evaluative side. But it's still a thin concept. If I say you are healthy, healthy is what's known as a thick concept. And that's because it's got factual aspects to it and evaluative aspects tied together, fused together. So uh, the physical might be, uh, you've got a blood pressure in this range, OK? And it is good to have a blood pressure in that range, OK? So healthy is, a, is an example of a thick concept. Other thick concepts are things like brave, cruel, um, and so on and so on. You can probably start thinking them up for yourself. It's anything that's got a kind of double aspect to it, all right? Now, uh, people in ethics fight over this all the time. It's, uh, it's uh, up very much up in the air, yeah. So, but how is that different from saying that it's magnificent because you're making that judgment of magnificence? Well, it might be, it, that might be, in fact, be the answer. But when I, when I use a, a single concept like healthy, I say, he's healthy. Yeah. Okay, I haven't broken down the details or anything, but I've, been, I, I've told you something that's physical-ish, and evaluative simultaneously. Right, if I say he's cruel, I'm telling you something about his actual behavior with kittens and matches. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, also, and also really disapproving. Yeah. I mean, so, so saying that he's cruel yeah. has something to do with your, your value structure, you know, what, what you think is cruel versus not cruel. Well, it's not a question so much of me, my values, whether oh, it's my subjective. 
I mean, that's the Someone's value. Someone, it, could be, it could be values of Plato's heavens, like up and run. Okay, yeah. so there's, there's, there is some sort of evaluative system, and you're making a comparison of the objective evidence against that evaluative system. I think Well, magnificent is also an evaluative system. Like, what's Maybe. your aesthetic? Yeah, 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 I meant it, I meant it to be. I think I mean, James has persuaded us that there are things and concepts we can argue about which Which, 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 which ones and why they are. Fair enough. Okay, now here's the analogy I want to uh, uh, create. Um, uh, uh, to say that there are some concepts which are thick in the math physics realm. Okay, they are simultaneously they are simultaneously physical and mathematical, and they're interwoven like this. That, that I don't know how you guys think of applied math, but I just think of it as simply this: you've got some part of the physical world, okay, and here's Plato's heaven. <laughs> Okay, and what you do is you, you, you look for structurally similar models here, all right? And then when you find one, it's a conjecture, you may not, you may not get it right. Uh, you can calculate here and so on, and then interpret back and make predictions about what you'll experience here. Okay, it's, it's pretty straightforward, and I think it's pretty widespread, I'm not saying anything new. What might be new is that there are a small number of concepts that are used interchangeably mathematically and physically. And the best examples I can think of this um, are um, things like velocity and acceleration. Think of how you learn, if you had a typical mathematics education, think of how you learn to uh, make um, velocities and acceleration the first and second derivatives. I bet you learn not from the physics class, but probably from the mathematics, from your first calculus book. Now the calculus book is full of uh, applications to illustrate things, but it had it had a section or maybe even a whole chapter devoted to telling you that velocities are the first derivative and acceleration is the second derivative, and and then give you lots of examples of this, so that now it's so deeply entrenched that you can just go back and forth from the physical, the actual physical motion or acceleration to its mathematical representation, as if it were all one thing. Here's a, listen, I got this quote from Spivak, you know Spivak's famous calculus book. You can feel the second derivative when you sit in an accelerating car. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you believe that? How many of you, you actually believe that? How many of you talk like that? <laughs> I don't believe it for a minute, yeah, but yeah, I do it's, talk like that. <laughs> is the jerk. Yeah, I know you the jerk. Feel, you can feel the jerk when the elevator starts. Yeah, yeah. So, do you actually believe you can feel the second derivative? <laughs> well, you're, you're, uh, and, and you, can, you can see it in other people, and in, in traffic. There's some evidence that people can perceive acceleration in other cars. And so you no, perceive acceleration, traffic. yes. Perceive the second derivative, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's how tightly linked they are. Okay. Yeah, and the, you're, you're making my case wonderfully. I, I'm very happy to be Yeah, <laughs> I, I shouldn't really be quarreling with you. Everybody has a purpose, and my tea has a bad example. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Are, are, we, are we bumping into embodied cognition in some sense, or is that a whole different No, thing? I wasn't thinking of that at all. But you see, what I was thinking is that look, the ordinary way we think of applied math, here's the physics. Here's where you act, things actually move yeah. or accelerate. Here's the representation of it as a derivative or second derivative. This is what you see in the lab or feel in, in a car, and this is how you represent it. But, but you're, I think it's wonderful that like you're insisting. I, I don't think there is a distinction. I've, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <right. laughs> <laughs> For me, this was ordinary modeling. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now it's, it turns out that it's really thick. <laughs> it's much thicker than I thought. But yes, but so I, much. I, <laughs> but I am delighted to have you argue this way. Okay. All right. So here's the play. Yeah. Just a comment. But yeah, to me, this is always just a little bit mysterious because that presumes that space and time are 
are the continuum. Oh, well, that's the illusion. And it, it yeah, presumes yeah. That, that we literally can take derivatives the same way we do with the mathematical uh, continuum. And that's, uh, for one thing, manifestly false. You can't yeah. say anything beyond the slang plane. Yeah. Can, can we just pretend, for, for the sake of the talk, that we live in a Newtonian world? Yeah. Okay, so the philosophical point will be is, is about, is about that. Okay. Your, everything you say is exactly right. But then I would be really stuck for a good example. Okay, so we'll have we'll live in false physics land and, and, <laughs> and have thick, some concepts, not everything, but some things like the uh, accelerations and velocities. By, by the way, accelerations and velocities are discrete for me. Oh, he's getting worse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was worried about the reception of my cranky. <laughs> All right. Now, claim, conjecture. Okay. I'm now going to go back to the continuum hypothesis, and the the here's the question. Okay. It's legitimate in principle, I think, this line of reasoning, even if it doesn't quite work in this case. Why does it work? If it does work, why? What's what's doing it? And think of how hard it is to explain this, because there is no mathematical proof of the continuum hypothesis or its negation. So we can't just, you can't think of anything that I do as merely a sketch that could be completed, you know? It's got to be something else entirely. Answer. Mathematics, normal mathematics, including set theory, is nothing but thin concepts. Pure physics is nothing but thin concepts. What's going on here? is with randomness, symmetry, independence are not your normal thin concepts which are easily formulated inside math. It's got to be something else. Conjecture. It's thick. It's thick randomness. It's thick symmetry. It's thick uh, independence. And that's somehow, I don't know the details of that, why it makes it work. But that would, that would make it possible to have a, a legitimate argument refuting the continuum hypothesis using concepts which just seem ordinary every day should be easily formulatable. Okay? I'm really confused about the definitions of thick and Just think of it as double aspect. So, so, so when you're thinking, when you're thinking velocity, you're thinking of actual physical motion. You're thinking physical motion and mathematical representation of physical motion as if it were just bound like that. And some people might even say inseparable, which they often do in ethics. Okay, so there it is, the legitimacy of that. Now, I've got a minute left. You want to talk about Gowers? You guys like Gowers? There's thick. Pure mathematics? <laughs> Thin applied mathematics. <laughs> and both thick. But, but Rob, your book is thick. <laughs> but if you stack the applied math on top of the other one, I, I admire Gower's going to extra ability and his reach and lots of other things. I admire all the ways he's using it. Uh, uh, there's one thing that uh, Gower's has now become famous for that some philosophers are interested in. This is the claim that um, uh, proof equals uh, explanation plus guarantee. Do you know this? Anybody know this? Oh, none of you have seen, you've well, seen it. I've seen your talk. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, this is actually uh, a much more general point, and if you're not interested, uh, I'll, I won't spend more than a minute. Let me just spend one minute on it. Okay, so Gowers, Gowers didn't actually say this. Somebody has attributed this. They say, this is Gowers' view, and they put it in this simple formulation. And Gowers, as far as I know, has embraced it. Now, it, almost everybody is focused on this, because explanation is a really interesting question. You know, when you, it's the difference between proving things and actually proving things in a way that is incredibly edifying. Okay, but make, how cashing that out is really hard. And um, but the guarantee, everyone just passes over. It, it just means proof, you know, ordinary proof. But actually, if you change that, 
you, we'll all be happier. Um, you, I think you will, and I will. Think of how you use guarantee in everyday life. You don't mean it the way you mean proof. You mean you go to the store and you buy a new computer or a toaster or an iPhone and it comes with a guarantee, right? And the guarantee doesn't promise you God will commit suicide if this doesn't work. <laughs> it just says, we'll give you your money back, or we'll fix it, or we'll replace it, or something like that, right? What if math became, if proofs and evidence became guarantees in this weaker sense? Everything comes with a guarantee, okay? And that means you don't have to apologize for not having a, a traditional proof. You just say, look, I got this. And it comes with a guarantee. Namely, you find a flaw, I'll fix it. <laughs> not very far from proof like one night in search. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's better than that because you don't get to say, you don't get to say what, what works. So, I mean, if Rob comes and he says, look, it, it's not working, then the community has spoken. It's like your, your iPhone is broken in two. Yeah. <laughs> All you, but there is one thing that you actually do have to assume to make this weaker sense of guarantee work, and that is you do have to assume mathematics is self-correcting. That's a huge assumption, um, and I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you think of math as a game, like chess, well, there's no reason in the world for thinking it's self-correcting. You can change the rules of chess, and no one would say, we were wrong about how a bishop should move. Uh, we made a mistake and now we've corrected it. That would be just idiocy. All you can say is, the game's more fun to play now. Okay? But you have to be uh, some kind of mathematical realist to believe there is such a thing as mathematical truth and we're in the business of trying to discover it. And sometimes we get it wrong. But we can improve as time goes by. If you believe that, then you can, you can have something like this but it is a weaker sense of guarantee. So that actually doesn't have much to do with the continuum hypothesis. In particular, it's in fact a, a blanket recommendation. Okay, I've taken enough time. <laughs> <laughs>